Okay, so uh, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, big thanks to Ilya. And uh, uh, by the request of Ilya, I will uh, share a little bit of my thoughts on how we can use our technology for actual advancement of uh, advocating uh, health and longevity uh, to everyone. Um, we're currently part of uh, Giro.ai. Uh, it's um, a drug discovery company. Uh, which primarily focusing uh, on uh, discovering drugs for prolonging human longevity, decelerating uh, uh, or even stopping aging. And we are very happy to announce that we just a couple of months ago, we uh, entered in uh, uh, drug discovery collaborations, uh, collaboration with Pfizer. We also have uh, several other uh, great collaborators uh, under our belt. Uh, such as uh, Humanity and National University of Singapore. Um, uh, but uh, I want to begin with the problem. We here uh, think that uh, longevity industry is growing because we are inside of it and we see uh, a big progress. But uh, uh, to be honest, uh, if we talk to uh, uh, external people, longevity is still a very small niche, a very small niche. Uh, I just looked at... Uh, um, people attending the biggest conference probably on longevity drug discovery in Copenhagen. And uh, actually, uh, there are more people who attend Flat Earth uh, International Conference that uh, the, the, the best conference uh, in longevity. So, uh, I mean, probably the, this conference will become the best con uh, conference, of course. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, uh, the problem is uh, we're still in the beginning. We have to advance the industry a lot uh, to, to, to jumpstart it. Um, and I think, uh, and you'll probably agree with me that uh, we are about uh, seven to 15 years uh, um, until we actually uh, can use or bring uh, radical uh, longevity and aging interventions to the market. And today we only have... Uh, lifestyle interventions and supplements uh, to work with and uh, probably the public discourse has to focus uh, has to be more focused on that on what we can actually do today and we, uh, how we can prolong uh, lives uh, of existing people so uh, a little bit of a background uh, in Jiro we are primarily focused on um, uh, data mining and understanding longitudinal human level data um, uh, and we are probably one of the best teams in uh, understanding aging signal uh, in all sorts of data, uh, dynamic relation, uh, EMRs, uh, steps, and many other types of data. Uh, and what we have consistently seen uh, in uh, human data that uh, human express two phenotypes of aging, and it's uh, very important you will understand why. Uh, it's uh, one of uh, a gradual loss of resilience phenotype, in the uh, um, uh, first part of life and at about 50 to 70 years old, there is a transition to a frail late life phenotype. Why this is important is because uh, mice, which uh, as you have uh, seen before in uh, other talks, are a, prim a primary model to model aging. And mice only express one phenotype of aging, the late life phenotype. So when we will uh, translate the results from mice to humans, uh, uh, we will probably cater to the late life human phenotype. Uh, and uh, this will still add a lot of healthy years to human lives. But uh, uh, the, uh, what we're trying to focus in Jiro is the uh, first uh, uh, early life phenotype. So again, as I said, we, we, we looked at uh, all sorts of uh, data uh, and uh, um, um, we uh, try to mine targets in, 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 in uh, uh, this sort of data. Uh, we also looked at EMRs, so we uh, look at longitudinal EMR data and we can see aging in this uh, poorly structured signal as well. And by the way, this is the nature of collaboration of, with Pfizer and, and these are the preliminary results of modeling uh, biological age acceleration and aging uh, in this data. But uh, the, the main focus of what I want to tell you today is actually how we used STAPS 
to uh, uh, measure biological age and why uh, it is, um, uh, in my opinion, the, the most cost-effective uh, biomarker of aging. So uh, we, uh, uh, as an input, we can take steps per minute signal uh, or steps and heart rate per minute a signal. And uh, as you probably know, there are 6 billion smartphones in the world. So uh, our, uh, in comparison to our other uh, agent biomarkers, our approach is scalable. Uh, it is, it, and it is scalable like a tech product, not like a, just a, a repeated uh, product. So uh, we can use this signal. It, it works best for groups of people or for people on population level and assess whether uh, the intervention uh, is working uh, on, a, you know, on, on groups of people or uh, populations. Um, why uh, I use it? First, it's very convenient. Uh, a user just have to once allow access to uh, the data which is already being collected in the phone, and uh, it's non-invasive, and uh, uh, then users can forget it, and uh, the data is still being collected, and the, the experiment is going on. He, he might be a control subject, and uh, he wouldn't even know that he is. Uh, the second one is, of course, the costs. Uh, as I said, it scales like a tech product. And as you know, DNA methylation uh, costs, if you buy it uh, as, a, as a consumer, it costs about $300. And even though is, uh, the fidelity is better, you need to buy at least twice. And uh, you would, uh, you're looking to spend $200 to, to $600 just on DNA methylation. And if you're doing an experiment, the cost adds up. Um, and many other clocks are uh, more expensive and again cumbersome in, uh, cumbersome in terms of uh, labor involved in uh, collecting them. Um, and uh, the, the deferred uh, very interesting um, feature is that you can use it retrospectively. So if a user allows access to his uh, health kit and uh, or Google feed, uh, you can then look back in, uh, into his past and for instance to com compare uh, against some intervention that you know has happened and you can see that user or users uh, change their uh, trajectory their uh, uh, biological age trajectory uh, we taught the model on uk biobank data and uh, that it's the uh, very uh, good secret why it works uh, because uk biobank is well annotated and if you just collect uh, data from smartphones, it's, uh, um, it's hard to use it because uh, you don't have tax of what this data actually means. Uh, we have also our own proprietary data set and uh, several other uh, biobanks. Um, and again, you will, of course, uh, ask me why not just use average steps? Why you, do you need an AI model which uh, is trying to see something uh, more uh, in this signal? Uh, and uh, the answer would be uh, steps is already a great biomarker of uh, fitness. Uh, it, it predicts uh, mortality and morbidity quite well, uh, but uh, we do even better job uh, than just steps. For instance, if you divide uh, population, uh, and you'll know that the more you move, the, the more you live. Uh, it's like a usual type of knowledge, but if you divide uh, uh, sample by occupations, uh, you see uh, the counterintuitive data. Suddenly, the more you move, the faster you die. So like in, in the company, we joke, uh, if someone pays you to do steps, uh, it's probably uh, bad steps. Uh, so like our, our biomarker uh, actually uh, is selective and it uh, filters out those data and we have like a, a, a very nice uh, relationship there. Uh, the, the second uh, thing, uh, which is important, we uh, were not as precise as DNA methylation clocks, but uh, we have about the same fidelity as a blood-based uh, phenoH clocks, so uh, uh, which is quite good for a non-invasive tool. And uh, we, for instance, test um, yeah, the, the, the likelihood to die from COVID-19, and just amount of steps doesn't predict it. So, like. People move quite good and then they die, but uh, our biomarker was able to predict uh, the death from COVID as did the uh, blood phenoage uh, Morgan Levin's uh, clock. And uh, again, if uh, we looked at uh, lockdown data, 
and uh, uh, sud it was a point of time when suddenly everyone stopped moving. And if you just used steps as a predictor of deaths, you would predict that everyone would, would die. Uh, but yeah, our, our, my, our biomarker did, did much better job. Uh, it didn't quite see uh, any changes. Uh, we also have a metric of resilience. So uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, we, we observed that humans have two phenotypes of aging. And uh, there is a point of human life where there is a transition between these phenotypes. And we believe we can uh, we can catch this point uh, of transition. And uh, this is probably uh, the best way for uh, public authorities to intervene. Uh, it's the best way to, to, to force a person to switch to healthier lifestyle. Uh, uh, that's the, the uh, example of uh, our biomarker used on uh, population. We can uh, see the effect of, intermi of intermittent fasting. So we actually see that people who start intermittent fasting uh, have a lower biological age. And uh, for some reason for men, uh, it works a little bit better than for women. Uh, we can also predict smoking, if, if people smoke or not. And we also have uh, confirmed that people who used to smoke they actually transition back to healthy uh, trajectory. So quitting smoking uh, uh, actually resets you uh, back to almost healthy state. Um, and uh, again, answering Ilya's question, how can we leverage uh, these uh, findings to promote longevity? I think the two most important uh, points are, first, we can uh, have a up-bottom approach using it to track public health for instance, for municipalities uh, or for states, we can use it to track how population is responding, for instance, to a building of a park or for a, another public health uh, initiative like teaching or uh, introducing um, uh, free exercises or, or, or something. And so uh, you can actually see live how uh, it is affecting uh, your population. Uh, and uh, the other one is a bottom-up approach, and this is still on the ID level, and we invite everyone to, to, to work with us. Uh, uh, it would be the idea to uh, test longevity protocols, the combination of lifestyle interventions and supplements. Uh, Alexei Moskalev has uh, talked extensively how important it is to test combinations, so we propose starting to test them in humans, both from a scientific point of view and just from a point of view of um, enthusiast. And we want to build a system which would uh, do a lot of iteration of this testing and we will have uh, human level uh, data um, on which interventions and combination of uh, interventions uh, have some signal in humans. Uh, we also invite everyone to collaborate. We want to be, we really want to be a part of any human trial of longevity interventions. We want to be a, like a digital biomarker part of this intervention. So please uh, write us, we would happily uh, join you. We also uh, are happy to test uh, supplements uh, and other interventions. And uh, we are also happy to work uh, with health tech companies uh, to uh, as a backend tool to assess the uh, efficacy of what these health companies uh, do with uh, humans. We already collaborate with Humanity PepsiCo and National University of Singapore. Again, we can, uh, with Singapore, we do a deeper collaboration, not just uh, steps, but we will look a lot uh, uh, and deeply into the data they collect uh, in uh, order to assess the agent signal. And uh, this research actually has led to great uh, publication in popular press, so Scientific American and TechCrunch has written about it. And uh, we have uh, Brian Kennedy of uh, on our uh, scientific advisory board, as well as Andrei Gutkov. Uh, so please uh, save my contacts and uh, I will be happy to talk to you and uh, collaborate with you. Thank you. Um, very cool. Uh, I um, wanted to ask two questions. One, uh, what age do you see this transition in your data from uh, the young aging to the old aging? 
Um, the second one is if you integrate um, more biomarkers to it. So you said not all steps are equal, right? So if somebody's paying you to do these steps, maybe there's some other things that are happening there. Um, when you integrate heart rate and breathing and that kind of data, which you can, I guess, also get from the watch, right? Um, is there significant, like, does it add to your predictive power at all? Or steps are the most important factor uh, from what you found? Yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, the first uh, answer, uh, what was the first question? Uh, age transition between- Oh yeah, old... it's about 50 to 70 years old on average, but it depends a lot on a particular human. Um, so the second uh, answer is we have uh, steps and heart rate model. Um, it's, uh, it, it has a little bit uh, better predictive power and we, we actually are working on uh, improving uh, models constantly and uh, um, yeah, as one data, when other sensors become available, we of course will introduce it. So like what, what we are doing best is uh, working with longitudinal signal and uh, when we'll have more sensors uh, in wearables, of course, it, it will be better. Uh, the, 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 the best part about steps is that uh, it's collected by the usual smartphone. So, and there are 6 billion smartphones in the world. So like it's the, the most uh, accessible biomarkers we have on a, on a public health uh, level. And uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, only about 100 million people have wearables and uh, less than half of them measure uh, heart rate. So uh, like the likelihood of uh, meeting a person with wearable is not, not as high as you would think. Like um, in, in, in the healthiest uh, and the most health conscious people, uh, about 20 to 25% of our wearables, even, even in, among this population, you can, you can actually look at the people in uh, here, like about the force of them uh, are very wearable. So yeah, the signal is better, but uh, steps are good because they are ubiquitous. Sorry, one minute. Oh. So Okay. And resilience. Um, but I don't know how it managed to calculate it because I don't have a wearable. So how, how did the app manage to do that? Yeah, as I said, your phone collects uh, your steps in step per minute increments. Uh, so we have this trajectory, which uh, we take a, a last month or a last week uh, worth of data. And actually, it's an interesting question. So I actually have a slide about it, uh, why it works. So um, yeah, do you know, uh, like uh, Alexei and other people, they uh, track animals in a lab. So they, they, they put the camera in a cage and they track uh, how mice are moving or how sea elegants are moving or how fish are moving. And uh, the uh, uh, movement patterns of an animal uh, change uh, with uh, age. Typically, uh, animals move less uh, and they exhibit less exhibitory beha uh, exploratory behavior. Uh, with humans, we believe we actually measure the same thing. So if you, if you have this step per minute increments uh, and take a month's worth of this data, it becomes a sort of a, a movement trajectory of a human through his environment and uh, thus we then uh, our AI model assesses whether it is looking like a movement of a healthy person or uh, it more resembles the movement of a person with a chronic disease or a person who is about to die soon. And then uh, it assesses biological age acceleration and uh, 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 removes this uh, value from uh, the value of your calendar age and yeah. So, so I can expect to get younger very soon. Yeah. Using your app. Thank yeah, you. Yeah.